Hi, so we'll talk about uh, economic indicators today. So this is part of the India China series that we were covering uh, earlier. So we'll talk about this entirely in the uh, context of India and China. So we'll look at the performance of India and China in these indicators. We'll try to understand what they are first. We'll try to understand uh, the performance of India and China and we'll also compare the two countries. So this is going to be a video with lots of facts. So you might uh, you might not want to remember all of them, but it's OK to have some idea about, uh, you know, where different things stand. So first we'll try to understand the population of India and China. So how does India look? How does China really look? So they, they are very, they are very large countries with a very huge population and they have a significant effect on how the world uh, goes forward. So that is the point of this entire series. So the total population here uh, is 1.36 billion estimated, of course. So that is, uh, so that is the population of India. So this side is, uh, the left side usually is India in this PPT and the right side you have China. So the total population of India is 1.36, while for China it is close to 1.4. These are estimates, not uh, proper numbers. And it is also estimated that in 2030, the population of India will be 1.5 billion. And in 2030, the population of China will be 1.44 billion. So we are expected to cross the population of China uh, close to somewhere uh, around 2027. So population density, India's population density, so that is the number of people who live in uh, one square kilometer. So that is 325. And for China, it is 153. The population is very similar if you notice 1.36 and 1.40. So the population is similar, but the density is quite different. So that means uh, obviously that China's area is quite larger compared to India. Growth rate of our population is close to 1.2%, while for China, it is 0.59%. So this is basically because China was very aggressive with its population policy. You might remember the one-child policy, which was uh, brought in 30 years ago. So because of that, the population of pyramid of China is uh, very skewed. The population of uh, population pyramid of India is a, a typical bell-shaped pyramid. So you might want to check that out. Life expectancy in our country. Life. Wh what is the average time for which an, uh, for which an India uh, for which an Indian person will live? So that is 69.7 here, and for China it is 76.5. So that is some uh, major increase there. Sex ratio is also something that is uh, that is that is a major uh, part of uh, you know understanding a particular population. So basically, in most of the countries, the number of males will be more than the number of females. So uh, that's just how it is. And uh, there are 1.1 males per female in our country, while the ratio is 1.14 for China. So China has more number of males per female. So the sex ratio is not uh, you know really good in China. India does relatively better, but still not very good. So we'll talk about labor force now. So this is about the population. 1.36 billion people uh, live in India, starting from the youngest uh, children, the infants till the oldest people. So out of that, what is the what is the percentage of people who actually are in the working age? So that turns out to be uh, something close to 500 million, 500, 501 uh, million in our country. And it is something like 778 million in uh, China. So obviously, uh, population wise and labor force wise, China is number one and India is India is at number two. So China has a very large uh, working age population, but that is rapidly declining because the growth rate is very low. At uh, you know by 2050, the population is supposed to reduce from the existing number. So labor force is going to drastically reduce. While for India, it will it will cross 750 million in the coming uh, few uh, few decades. So how is the labor force really distributed? Where do the people of these two countries work? So there are basically three sectors, as you might know, you have the primary sector, the secondary and the tertiary sector. So primary sector is more about agriculture. It's not just agriculture. You also have people working in, uh, working in mining industry, for example. Industrial sector will have various industries. It will also involve manufacturing. Services, of course, is an entire sector of its own. So in India, it seems agriculture, for agriculture, 41.49% of the people of our country work in agriculture. For industry, it is close to 26.9 and for services, it is 32.33. So there is this common uh, point in uh, common point in understanding uh, the distribution of labor force. If the number of people who work in agriculture are relatively lesser uh, compared to services in industry, that means your economy has actually progressed. So if, uh, in, a, in a developed economy, usually, the services, the number of people working in services uh, sector will be very high. So if you compare India and China here, agriculture here is 41, there it is 27, for industry 26, there it is 29. So industry is somewhat similar. The major difference between India and China are, uh, you know, are between the first and the third sectors. So services, they have a lot more people working in services. So they are relatively uh, developed compared to India. So that is one thing. So to just give you a perspective about uh, how a developed country looks like, the uh, for USA, for example, 
the number of people working in the agriculture sector is only 1% and the number of people working in industry is 19%, the number of people in services that's uh, close to 80%. So that is how a developed country uh, looks like. So these, are, these two are develop, uh, developing countries. India is classified as a lower middle income country and uh, China is classified as an upper middle income country. Unemployment rate is also important. You have a very large workforce, but uh, you know what percentage of the workforce is actually finding some gainful employment. So in our country, the unemployment ratio is 5.4%. The 5.4% of the uh, labor force is not able to find employment, uh, employment in a proper way. In China, it is relatively lower. It is able to create uh, jobs much better than uh, India, India can. So uh, there the rate is close to 3.6%. Youth unemployment is something different from unemployment. Unemployment is measured in so many different ways. It, it could be seasonal un, uh, unemployment, it could be something that is temporary or it could be long term or you could also divide that based on who uh, really is unemployed. So you can classify that based on middle age, old age and youth. So it so happens that for youth uh, usually the unemployment rate is very high in all the countries. So the youth unemployment in our country is close to 23.8 and for China it is 10.4. The numbers here, uh, to repeat again, they are not really proper, they are very dynamic, it changes continuously. So especially since India and China are rapidly uh, changing, it's important that you keep tabs on these numbers uh, regularly. The most uncertain numbers out of all these numbers mentioned here will be the numbers of unemployment. So uh, that is especially because, because of COVID-19, we are not able to understand how many people are unemployed and how many people are in what situation. So these numbers are uh, uncertain and very dynamic. But the trend is the unemployment rate in India is in general higher than the unemployment rate in China. This is one other slide which talks about uh, you know how the population of these two countries look like. So there are some indices here. The first uh, major in, uh, major index that you see here is human development index. So there are basically three different uh, you know dimensions of human development index. Uh, it was it was initially developed uh, uh, by a Pakistani economist and the Indian economist Amartya, Amartya Sen also had a major say in how uh, this was developed. So uh, the human development index for India is close to six point uh, you know point six four five. And that is categorized as medium uh, human development. For China, it is 0.758, that is significantly larger uh, compared to India. And that is also uh, classified as uh, medium, but it's more like upper medium. So what are the dimensions of the human development index? You have three major dimensions. You have long and healthy life. The other thing is education. Uh, the other thing is decent standard of living. So these are dimensions, but there are specific indicators with which you try to understand these dimensions. For example, in HDI, uh, HDIs, you have education. So education, you look at main years of schooling for that particular country. You also look at the expected years of schooling. For health, you look at the average life expectancy. So you look at the life expectancy at birth. So that will be one indicator. For, uh, for you know, uh, the prosperity with which people live, you will look at the gross national income of the country per capita. So these are some of the dimensions and the uh, subsequent indicators. So some uh, method is used and eventually you get this particular figure. So the figure is between 0 and 1 to be very clear. So you also have other indicators. There are so many indicators to measure the welfare of a uh, you know, population. So you would have heard about, uh, let's say, the global hunger index. So that also uh, that tries to understand what is the level of hunger in a particular country. So there are so many indices, but HDI is one of the most important one. There is also something related here. This is called IHDI. Uh, the expansion of that is inequality adjusted uh, HDI. So in HDI, there were three indicators. Education is one thing and then you have uh, health and then you also have uh, prosperity level, the income level. But here you are including uh, inequality as uh, in inequality is a fourth dimension. So it is inequality adjusted human development index. So that drastically brings up the human development index of most countries. And for India, it comes down to 0 0.475. For China also, the, because of inequality, it reduces from 0 0.758 to 0 0.636. So if we adjust for inequality, both uh, India and China actually uh, fare very poorly in human development index. So that is one thing. There is also this dedicated uh, index, which dedicated uh, you know index, which talks about the inequality level of the uh, level of a particular country. So this was developed by an Italian uh, economist called uh, he, his, his last name was Gini. So this Gini coefficient. Uh, to, to put it shortly, if it is zero, it means that every single person in that country is receiving the same income. So absolutely no difference at all. If it is one, it means one single person is getting all the income and the rest of the people get absolutely nothing. So Gini coefficient for India is 33.9 uh, and for China it is 46.7. So uh, compared to India and China, China is actually uh, having more inequality. So uh, that, is, that is basically because China has regional disparities in development. 
regional disparity in development is there in our country also bihar for example is not very really, uh, well developed but the southern states are uh, relatively uh, relatively developed but that inequality that regional disparity is very high uh, in china so that is uh, one thing we talk about poverty levels and we also talk about the number of people who are billionaires so this uh, has a rapid you know this is a very uh, very simple way to understand how uh, inequality is actually manifested so when we talk about poverty we start at 1950 because that is one major point for the history of india and china china obviously uh, you know uh, the prc actually started the people's uh, you know communist party they started uh, from 1950 and at 1950 we became uh, a republic 3 years after independence so in the 1950 the poverty rate for india was close to 65% for china it was kind of similar 70 to 75% but these numbers are approximate all the numbers here mentioned are very very approximate they are not uh, you know they are not perfect in any sense the numbers are especially uh, skewed for poverty uh, measurement because we don't really understand how to uh, measure poverty so you can base uh, different poverty lines and poverty line is not something that is uh, you know it's it, it's not a very solid way to actually measure poverty so there are so many indices for poverty measurement also you have something called multi dimensional poverty index if you are interested you could look up that but in general the point is these numbers are not very accurate and they only give the basic trend so specifically looking at india by 1990 at the time when reforms were implemented the economic liberalization reforms were implemented the poverty rate was close to uh, 46% you know one one or two decades after the economic reforms were initiated the poverty reduced drastically to 25% after 2010 we redefined the poverty line we tried to uh, understand poverty in a much more uh, better way and somehow uh, by by 2020 the poverty is estimated to be 15% so these are estimates and approximate numbers to repeat again for china uh, it is it is a classic case uh, in the entire world where the most number of people were removed out of poverty in one go so more than 800 million people were removed out of poverty in, in just about 3 decades in just about 2 or 3 decades so by 1980 1980 was a time a uh, very important uh, phase for china when economic liberalization had actually started so at that point of time chinese people were still extremely poor they were uh, 66% of them were living uh, in poverty below the poverty line so uh, one basic standard here is if the person is living below 1.9 dollars uh, per day then that is considered to be uh, you know poverty so uh, by 2010 you can see the drastic difference so within 30 years of uh, you know economic liberalization and development the poverty has reduced from 66% to only 11% so in 2010 our poverty rate was 25 in 2015 it reduced further so it was at 11% in uh, 2010 in just 5 years it has reduced to 0.7% so that is a massive decrease uh, for china at the same time because of uh, because of foreign investments uh, improvement in technology in uh, improvement in exports and everything the number of billionaires in china also increased uh, massively we also have a lot of billionaires in our country they are close to 102 so that's an approximate number but this is more certain compared to poverty numbers and the number for china is 389 so the number of billionaires the highest is in usa of course it's close to 500 something for china it is 389 for india it's uh, one or two so india has the third largest number of billionaires so that is one sad thing because we still have a high uh, poverty ratio in our country so this is how the population looks like yeah so this particular slide is uh, really very important because we are introducing a lot of terms and we want to understand those terms this basically relates to the uh, the so called gdp so gdp the expansion of that if you don't know is gross domestic product so all of these terms if you just take a moment to think about the three different parts uh, you know think about the abbreviation then you will actually get some uh, meaning out of it so gdp stands for gross domestic product so we'll see the definition for gdp alone and we'll look at the other indicators based on the definition of gdp okay so the definition is gdp is the total monetary value or the market value of all the finished goods and services produced within a country's borders in a specified time period so this is a very crisp definition with a lot of keywords involved so the first thing that you could possibly notice is that it is the market value of all the goods and services are we going to consider just about every goods and services no we are only considering the finished goods and services for example you produce and you actually get an apple from some uh, you know holds from a retail trader then the value of the apple let's say one particular apple is let's say 100 rupees so you do, you are not going to count the value that is actually produced by the farmer you're not going to count the value of the wholesale trader you're not going to uh, count the value of the retailer so you're only going to see the finished product 
and then you're going to you know expand uh, expand that for every single goods and every single services in the in that particular country so it is produced whatever is produced within the country's borders that is also the other keyword and the last import most important thing is that it should be in a specified time period so usually gdp is calculated on a yearly basis sometimes uh, you know for better understanding of how the economy functions you also calculate that in the quarterly basis so usually it is one year and we talk about uh, getting the aggregate value of all the uh, all the goods and services all the finished goods and services of the country so this is basically the definition of gdp we look at the other terms now so gdp is here so there is a related term here called as ndp so gdp stands for gross domestic product and ndp stands for uh, net domestic product so wherever there is this gross there is also always uh, this net that follows so what is the difference between gross uh, domestic product and net domestic uh, domestic product it means the gdp that is produced within the country it goes off somewhere so we want to understand where it goes off to so the related term here is depreciation so that is one important term so depreciation is something that uh, you will understand based on capital goods so let's say you uh, let's say you actually create a machine in your country and then you use that machine for some sort of a manufacturing purpose then uh, there is this there is this uh, very clear and uh, you know important uh, way in which machines work they depreciate over time their value decreases over time they have wear and tear so they cannot you know go on forever so after let's say 5 years you are going to replace that machine completely that's not going to work you're going to replace it completely so let's say in 2020 you invested uh, 1 crore to buy a machine in 2025 that's not going to work out so you're going to invest uh, 1 crore again so that means the value of the machine actually depreciates by 20% each year so it it depreciates by 20 lakhs each year so you take that depreciated value you extend that to all the goods and services of the country and you get a very large term called as depreciation so you have a this large term called as gdp you subtract a uh, depreciation out of that and then you get uh, ndp here so ndp is going to be the national uh, domestic product you also have two other uh, related terms you have gnp and nnp so again g here stands for gross n here stands for net so what is this gnp gnp is gross national product uh, nnp is of course net national product so what is the difference between gdp and gnp so we'll try to understand that so gdp is a gross domestic product but there are uh, so that's like all the products and services that are created in the country you put that together and then uh, you get some value so that will be gdp but that is not the only thing that you have only value that you produce in gdp let's say you have a company in your country and that company is very good in its operations and it goes and it goes abroad and works so if it goes abroad and works then uh, you will also have uh, you know profits coming from abroad so that those profits will come and come uh, you know it, it will fall as uh, the income of the country it will fall as part of the value of the country because it is the people of this particular country that is uh, who have actually produced that particular value so you go to the go to the foreign country you generate value you send it back across to a country so that is called as the net factor income from abroad so uh, there is this word here net uh that is because just like you just like your country might actually be good at something you go abroad get some income other countries also come into your country they produce some goods and services they get profits and income and they take it out of the country so the net factor income is a net amount of uh, income that you generate from uh, abroad from all the countries put together so you have gdp and you add that with a net factor income then you get gnp so that is how it works and again you have the concept of depreciation so gnp is not the only thing you depreciation is uh, you know uh, it's going to be there always depreciation is basically an accounting concept you want to understand uh, how money is uh, you know going waste because of natural processes and then gmp becomes nnp so uh, these uh, you know that is the basic explanation for these uh, four terms there are other terms also basically in all of this we are trying to have one single measure to understand the uh, you know the economic activity and we are trying to improve on those measures we are trying to see various uh, combinations of that particular measure to understand the real scenario so here you have a term called as gdp at factor cost and then you have gdp at market price so about this gdp when you calculate the total value of the goods and services in the country you could take for example the wholesale price so you could go to a wholesale dealer you could see what is, what is the price of uh, of a particular good what is the price of a particular service you could see that you could add that up together and then you get something called gdp at factor cost but that is not the real deal because the government intervenes here so this is the market and this is the household and this is the government the government has to exist so the government so this is a household this is the government so the government has to exist it carries out a lot of uh, functions 
for uh, you know the administration of the country and also for the economic regulation of the country so it needs a quite of a quite a lot of money for its operations so the government will obviously take taxes from the household and it will also give subsidies to the household in some cases so it takes taxes it gives subsidies so the government actually has a hand in how, in what amount of value is produced in the country so you have this gdp at factor cost so that will give you the actual uh, product uh, productive production level of the country but the gdp at market price is what uh, matters sometimes the, because the government is actually intervening so how do you convert gdp at factor cost to gdp at market price you add subsidies and then you remove taxes then that will be the uh, value of gdp at market price so those are uh, those are the two terms one other improvement is uh, nominal and real gdp now try to imagine uh, two countries they are extremely similar country number a country a and country b so they produce the same uh, num uh, same type of goods they produce the same number of goods their population is very similar and just about everything is similar so that is a tough uh, thing to imagine but just try to do that so in that case uh, you know let's say that the gdp value is obviously going to increase from time to time because growth happens so let's say that in one in country a for example the price of a price of a biscuit packet for example let's say is 100 rupees but in country b because of inflation the value uh, becomes 150 rupees so because of inflation coming into the picture the when you actually uh, put together the value of all the goods and services the value the gdp value for country b is actually going to be very high so that is the difference between nominal and real gdp nominal gdp takes it as such so it does not account for any inflation but real gdp accounts for inflation it uh, you know it tries to remove the effect of inflation on uh, on how things work and then you get something called as a real gdp so all the numbers that you that you would have heard about in the last one year it's all about nominal gdp the real gdp is not uh, not very easy to calculate it's calculated in a different way so that is the difference between uh, nominal and real interest rate uh, comes in between so uh, inflation comes in between you also have this very uh, important uh, improvement over gdp called as gdp in uh, purchasing power parity terms so purchasing power parity what it really means is that you have a basket of goods and you try to compare uh, how uh, compare the value of the basket of goods in one country or the other let's say you have a basket of goods containing uh, some food materials some uh, metals and everything so uh, that basket of goods what is that cost in country a and what is that cost in country b so you account for the difference in uh, the currency value you do some currency exchange and then you see what is the actual value so it so happens that in country a and and, and in country b there is a major difference in uh, how the basket of goods is actually valued because the demand and supply uh, the market forces really vary so what you try to do here is you try to understand if an average uh, citizen of country a and if an average citizen of country b how easy is it for him or her to afford that particular basket of goods so it is a comparison in that level it is very complicated to actually calculate gdp uh, for bbb terms because you have a basket of goods and that is very large and you have to account for the variation in each and every uh, goods and services so gdp in pbb terms that will actually tell you uh, uh, you know the value that is produced and how easy it is for that uh, for a citizen of that country to actually uh, uh, you know get that value from that particular economic activity so that is the improvement of gdp in ppp terms there are also two other terms gva and national income gva stands for uh, gross value added so we talk about gross value added because uh, you want to understand what is the value that is added by different uh, companies in different stages so let's say there is an agricultural uh, you know uh, uh, let's say rice production so rice production happens but then uh, you cannot you cannot really consume raw rice so you have to take it to an intermediate food processing industry and that food processing industry will actually do something it will make it uh, more easy for uh, the rice to be consumed and then you have the uh, different marketing uh, agencies in between ultimately it comes to your uh, plate so there are uh, multiple intermediaries involved we want to understand what is the value added by each and every inter intermediary in each and every good we extend that on the whole level and then uh, we get a gva so this uh, gross value added is very similar to gdp at factor cost so that is one thing national income so we also want to understand what is the income level of the average uh, person or average citizen of the country because we basically want to compare uh, one country with another and try to see how we are progressing so that is a point of all this uh, thing ultimately so for national income there is uh, you know a different way of calculating so you have gdp at market price so that will talk about the overall expenditure that a particular uh, you know that a particular person will actually make 
but GDP and market price does not account for everything. There are other things here. So you have households here. So households, what ultimately uh, you know stays with households that is uh, very important. But government is there on one side, and you also have firms on one side. So firms have uh, firms you know have a lot of profit. That profit is actually uh, profit is actually used for further investment. But sometimes the profit is not uh, used and it is kept as an undivided profit. So the, some money remains with the government. Some money remains with the firm. What actually comes back to households? We want to try to understand that, and that will be the actual national income. We take that on a per capita basis. You know, uh, you, you you have that overall national income level. You divide that by population. You will try to understand what is the average uh, national income. Per capita for the citizen of the country. So these are the different uh, terms involved. Yeah. So indirect taxes and subsidies is also probably covered. So we relate that with uh, GDP at factor cost and GDP at uh, market price. So, so these are the different terms involved. Yeah. So these are uh, these are different terms here related to GDP. We want to uh, uh, you know compare uh, these terms between India and China. Yeah. So the first thing is GDP, the nominal GDP value. So for India, it is estimated to be 2.8 trillion now, and uh, for China, it is estimated to be 15.42 trillion. So the GDP value itself uh, varies by you know the China's China's GDP is close to 5.5 times larger than that of India's. So if you remember uh, from the previous video in the 1950s when we started out, the GDP level was very very similar for both these countries, but now it has drastically uh, changed. We also explained that in the previous video. GDP in PPP terms, uh, it's at 9.6. So PPP terms, we want to understand uh, the purchasing power parity terms. So uh, the nominal value might be 2.8, but the average Indian is able to afford quite a lot of goods and services. Uh, so the PPP, PPP terms, it comes to 9.6. If it is not clear, let's just try to make that clear here uh, for one, once and for all. So PPP terms, it refers to uh, you know the basket of goods, and we try to uh, compare that. Let's say there is an Indian and he wants to buy a, a property in India. So that property will cost uh, way lesser than him actually going to a foreign country and buying. So in general, the prices, uh, the prices for various commodities and various services, it's very high in uh, foreign countries. And a direct, a direct conversion into currency is not really going to have a fair picture. So the availability of goods and services in our country is actually very high. The products in our country are actually very cheap. So that is why there is a huge difference between the nominal GDP and the uh, PPP GDP. So that is at 9.6 trillion here. And PPP terms, uh, the GDP value for China is 24.2. So nominally, India will be in the fifth or sixth position and China is in the second position. But in PPP terms, China is in number one position and uh, USA is in number two. India is at number three. So that is how uh, it works out. The average Indian citizen is actually able to uh, consume quite a lot. What is GDP per capita? So we are talking about nominal uh, terms here. So GDP per capita is something that you divide. You have this particular nominal GDP. You divide that by population. You will get one eight seven seven. And in case of China, it is uh, you know dollar ten thousand eight hundred and thirty nine. So there is a huge difference here. More than five times the differences. So that is basically, uh, you know, because the way in which China has developed, it has moved more towards service industry. It has developed its, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities very, uh, very highly, and it is exporting quite a lot. So that is the main uh, reason for why there is a big difference. So that is GDP per capita. So on on the basis of GDP per capita, you you can also classify different countries. So India is classified as a lower middle income country. China is obviously classified as an upper middle income country. So GDP per capita terms, India is ranked 142nd, while China is ranked only 59. So there are a bunch of, uh, you know, a large number of countries which exist between uh, these two per capita levels. Growth rate for GDP. So what is it for India? It is 4.2. So these are numbers from uh, 2019. So we don't want to, uh, we don't want to, you know, complicate matters by trying to understand what the effect of COVID-19 is. So before COVID-19 actually uh, struck the country. The uh, growth rate actually slowed down from uh, something like 6, 6.5 percent to 4.2 percent in late uh, in early 2019. And for China, it is 6.1 percent in the similar uh, time period. So China is actually growing much higher. There was a period in uh, 2020, uh, 2010s when India was actually growing. Uh, the growth rate of India was much higher compared to uh, China. But uh, that reduced after demonetization, GST and ultimately because of COVID. Let's understand the sectoral distribution of GDP. So what does each uh, sector actually contribute to the overall uh, GDP value of our country? So for our country, the agriculture contributes 16%, industry contributes something like 34% and services 
contribute uh, 49.9 percent so if you remember more than 42 percent of the people in our country were actually working in agriculture and related sectors but all those people put together uh, they only contribute to 16 percent that is basically because agriculture is limited as a sector you can't uh, you can't create value more than a particular limit so it uh, it, it uh, you know stabilizes after some time but it is not like that for services if people come more and more in services you can actually produce more value and with the inclusion of uh, new technologies and new uh, economic activities you can actually uh, increase the service sector uh, uh, service sector contribution to gdp comparing to the, comparing this to china agriculture contribution is only uh, 8% so it's half of uh, what it is in india and industry contribution is very significant but uh, we also have a significant share from the services sector so this is how the uh, different uh, you know sectors actually contribute to repeat again compared you know like like how we talked about the labor force distribution for gdp distribution also if the agriculture contribution is very less like let's say within 10% and the services contribution is more than 60% then it's considered to be you know kind of similar to a developed economy so china is more uh, closer to being a developed economy than india is so uh, india is aspiring to be that we can also divide GDP in terms of component. So, uh, how is the GDP actually consumed by different uh, factors, by different entities within the particular country? So, household consumption is actually 59.1% of uh, the overall level and the government is actually consuming 11.5%. Investment, investment is fixed capital is 28.5%. So, investment is uh, not the common uh, understanding of investment that you might have. In economics, investment is uh, defined more like uh, capital formation. So whenever there is capital formation, it it is counted as investment. So investment in fixed capital is close to 28.5%. So we are creating capital goods worth 28.5% each year. So that is what it means. Investment in inventories. So you also have investment in inventories. So they are, uh, you know, they are going to quickly go away. It is for the regular functioning of the economy. So that is a 3.9%. Exports of goods and services that actually contributes quite a lot of money. So the money is coming into the country. So you have 19.1% for that. And for imports, it's close to 22 uh, percentage. So we'll compare that with China. So what is the major difference here? The imports and exports are very similar. So here it is 19 and uh, 22. Here there, there it is 20 and 18. Investment in inventories is not very uh, big. We are investing more in inventories. They are investing lesser as a uh, you know share of overall GDP. Government consumption is not also very, uh, you know, dra very drastically different. China is spending a little more than the Indian government is actually doing. The major difference uh, is in two major things. So you have household consumption, you have investment in fixed capital. So these are, uh, you know, these are the two uh, indicate two components where there is a drastic difference bit, uh, in how GDP is distributed between India and China. So here in our country, the household consumption is extremely high. It's close to 60%, which means most of the people in our country are uh, uh, producing goods of their own and consuming it of their own. So that is at 60%. But in China, it is relatively lower. It is only at 39%, close to 40%. The most important uh, difference between India and China is that the investment in fixed capital is extremely high for China. It's close to 42.7%. In India, it is only 28.5%. Why is this very important? Uh, investment in fixed capital, it is it is basically your investment in infrastructure, your, your investment in uh, capital goods. So that will actually lead to uh, better economic activity in the long run. So that is the importance of uh, fixed capital. China has been focusing on uh, investing in fixed capital for many decades now. Starting from 1980s, they have uh, had a very high share of uh, investment in fixed capital as a, a share of GDP. So that is at 42.7% there, that is only at 28.5%. So you could also relate this to uh, the budget of 2021. Our government is actively trying to uh, increase its uh, spending on uh, investment or it is actually uh, it is actively trying to nudge different parts of the economy to uh, increase the spending on investment. So our number will actually slightly go up this particular year because of the uh, thrust from the budget. So that is the distribution. Public finances of uh, China and India, we look at uh, how different, uh, you know, public finances are there. So, you know the various parts of public finance, uh, public finance by now after the budget. So, there is of course government expenditure, you have receipt, you have fiscal uh, deficit, you also have public debt, which is not uh, discussed properly in the budget video. So, the government expenditure here for our country is 800 billion uh, US dollars, for government receipt will be 480 billion. 
uh, I think this includes, uh, you know, not just the expenditure of the central government, but also the expenditure of the state governments and everything. So again, the receipt also includes uh, expenditure of the central government and the state government. So it is 480 billion here and 800 billion there. So there is a huge uh, deficit here. So the deficit is something that you can uh, bridge by uh, various methods. You get, uh, let's say, non-debt creating capital receipts, but you also have debt creating capital receipts. So that will uh, lead to a very huge fiscal deficit. So these are very, uh, you know, th these are very new numbers after COVID-19. So this essentially means that the fiscal deficit, uh, as uh, announced recently by the finance minister, it's at 9.5% for, uh, for the last year, for 2020-21. For but for China, the fiscal deficit is only 6.5%. We'll also look at the expenditure in receipts. Expenditure is close to 3 trillion US dollars and receipts is 2.5 trillion US dollars. So it's it's like four times more expenditure and uh, more than five times more receipt. So that is how the Chinese government is. It's very large uh, and the fiscal deficit is 6.5%. We want to come to uh, the level of 6.5% in next year and the subsequent year. China is already at 6.5%. What is public debt? The government is obviously having some sort of a deficit each year. So it is borrowing from the market, it is borrowing from uh, individuals, it is borrowing from uh, uh, corporates or it is also borrowing from international institutions. So there is a lot of borrowing that the government is actually doing for the sake of development. Borrowing is good in one way because it will promote uh, creation of infrastructure, promote uh, you know capital expenditure and that will have a long term effect so the government will be able to pay. But politically uh, the governments you know there are some governments which tend to borrow quite more than what they can actually pay back so that leads to some problem. In our country we have borrowed quite a lot so the overall uh, debt that we are in that is at 89% of the GDP. So uh, what does this really mean? We have uh, we have borrowed for quite a long number of uh, years now for more for many decades. So each and every year because of that small deficit it accumulates over time and then you have a very large number. So what is that large number? It is at 89% of GDP. So uh, so uh, you don't need to worry too much because GDP is uh, GDP is a value that is produced in one single year. So it is 89% of the value uh, produced uh, value of goods and services produced in the country in one single year. But for China, it is significantly lower. It is only at 47%. In general, of course, it's nice if you are in, uh, you know, a lower uh, percentage of debt. In India, it is quite high. For USA, also, it is quite high. For USA, it is something like 90, uh, close to 90, 92%. For India, it is, uh, it is also uh, uh, comparatively high for a developing country. Foreign reserves. So uh, this basically talks about, uh, you know, what sort of... Uh, what sort of reserves the uh, country has of foreign currencies so we are having a uh, you know trade with uh, multiple countries you have imports you have exports so for exports you will get the foreign currency and you can store it for imports you will have to pay the foreign currency usually the foreign uh, you know export and import transactions they happen in uh, us dollars so we have a us dollar 590, 590 billion uh, worth of foreign currency it does not mean that all the money that we have the 590 billion here is only uh, in us uh, us dollars you have other dollars also you have other currencies also you have some money in uh, some money in euros for example similarly for china also foreign currencies are in multiple uh, currencies and china has a significantly higher uh, you know uh, foreign reserve overall because it has been engaging in trade with foreign countries for quite a long time especially uh, its its foreign reserves its foreign reserves is very high because it has exported quite a lot in general if you export a lot you will get a lot of uh, foreign reserves if you're importing a lot you will have to pay back so the foreign reserve will actually reduce so you will relate that this uh, relate this entire thing with the balance of payment crisis that we talked about in the last video so you have 3200 that is extremely high so india is at uh, the third position with foreign reserves and china is obviously in the number one position for foreign reserves credit rating and ease of doing business so these are uh, you know basically two terms which uh, talk about uh, the investor sentiment so if the credit rating is very high then obviously the uh, investment into the country is also going to be high so there are a lot of credit rating agencies you have moody's for example you have snp so we'll take one particular credit rating agency that is moody's and we'll see how india and china are really rated india is rated at baa3 so for moody's rating it starts from uh, aaa and it goes uh, all the way down to c so if you're rated aaa then you are uh, very good and there is very low credit risk and you are very attractive for uh, foreign investments if you're c then of course it's uh, very bad so baa3 it seems it is medium grade with some speculative elements and moderate credit risk so it is in the middle level our country so we have a moderate credit risk uh, in this country but china is rated significantly higher compared to india the credit rating is a1 
and it is upper medium grade so the grade that we are talking about it refers to uh, the grade in which we can uh, you know the investment uh, bond grades uh, that is a reference uh, it is making to and here the credit risk is very very low so uh, that is about uh, the difference in rating you also have this very significant uh, factor called as ease of doing business so ease of doing business is something uh, it, it is an it is an index released by the world bank so uh, the world bank actually talks about this ease of doing business it is a ranking for various countries india has actually significantly improved it was uh, somewhere in the hundreds earlier uh, a few years ago and it has implemented a lot of measures and it now it stands at 63rd similarly china was not really good a few years ago it was at 78 80 in that in that position and now it presently stands at 31 so if you if you if you had actually noticed the budgets of the previous years and the various announcements by the finance ministry in the previous years we have actually tried to significantly improve the way in which our uh, way in which the economic governance of the country works so that basically makes it easier for uh, foreign countries or even the local uh, local people to set up their business in their uh, in this particular country so if you remember india had the so called license raj from the previous video we talked about license raj so because of license raj if you had to set up a company you needed as much as 80 different licenses and it took a very long time so that obviously means ease of business uh, ranking will be very low so we understood that this ranking is very important because based on this ranking investments will come into the country so we are working on that now Thank you.